Within game theory, we can think about repeated play strategies. Strategies when there is repetition between both of the players. We frequently play the same people over and over again in our interactions in our daily lives. So what if players condition their behavior in one game on your behavior from previous games? Well, when that happens, more equilibria become sustainable. Repeated play can open up opportunities and can let us see different interactions and what might come from that. There are two main cases to consider, finitely repeated games and infinitely repeated games. So first up, let's think about finitely repeated games. The basic concept here is that we know when the last round of play is or we know how many iterations this game will take. We know we're going to play this game a finite number of times. We're gonna play this coordination game six times in a row, right? Something like that will happen. It's a finitely repeated game. Suppose two players are gonna play a prisoner's dilemma game a hundred times in a row. Could we get some cooperation in this finitely repeated game? Turns out the answer is kind of surprising. We don't really do a whole lot in terms of extending our equilibria in this finitely repeated game. Right? So let's think about this. If we were gonna play 100 Prisoner's Dilemma games in a row and we're player one and player two, on the 100th turn, we can think about what is gonna happen. Because this is a sequential game now, we're playing 100 in a row. And with sequential games, we can solve these via backward induction. So if we go to the end of the game, what happens on that 100th turn? On that 100th turn, it is in both players' interest to defect and not to cooperate. There is a dominant strategy for player two to defect in this case. Player two can sit and say, holding player one constant, what do I wanna do? I would like to not cooperate. Holding player one constant on not cooperating, what do I wanna do? Again, I would like to not cooperate. I have a strictly dominant strategy in a prisoner's dilemma game to not cooperate if I'm player two or if I'm player one. If we know that the game is going to be over after 100 rounds, there's no reason for me in round 100 to cooperate. It's strictly dominant for me to not cooperate. So since they both defect in this 100th round, in that last turn, no matter what, it's strictly dominant for them to defect. Threatening to defect if your opponent fails to cooperate in the second to last round, round 99, is no deterrent whatsoever. You're going to defect in round 99. You're going to play the don't cooperate, don't cooperate outcome in round 100. So there's no threat in round 99 if you say, hey, cooperate with me in round 99, or else I'll cheat in round 100. That's not a credible threat because the individual knows that in round 100, you're going to cheat anyway. So we can't sustain cooperation in round 99 by threatening anything in round 100. And so in round 99, what's going to happen is that we will get the dominant strategies as well. There's no reason for you to cooperate in round 99 because in round 100, everybody's going to cheat anyway. So in round 99, you just do what's best for you in round 99. There's no, well, if I cooperate now, maybe they'll cooperate with me in the next round. In round 100, it's dominant for everybody to cheat. So now in round 99, it becomes dominant for everybody to cheat also. There's no, well, if I cooperate now, you'll cooperate with me in the future. I know you won't cooperate in round 100, so in round 99, it's just all up in the air as well. And so we both cheat again in round 99. Now, because we're both going to cheat in round 99, because we're both gonna cheat in round 100, we can go back to round 98. In round 98, can we sustain any level of cooperation by doing something other than just playing our strictly dominant strategies? And the answer is once again, no. We can't say, hey, let's cooperate in round 98. And if you do that, then we'll cooperate in round 99. Why? Because in round 99, there is no reason for you to cooperate because in round 100, there's no reason for you to cooperate. 
And so there's no deterrent from defection in round 100, which means there's no deterrent from de defection in round 99, which means the same logic holds and there's no deterrent for defection in round 98, and there's no deterrent in round 97, 96, 95, and so forth. Pushing this logic backwards all of the way to the first turn unravels this game completely. The Nash equilibrium is to defect all the way through, even if we had some forms of communication here. The strict dominant strategy is to defect, and since we know the number of games that we're playing, we can go to the last game and see what our actions would be, and then use backward induction to figure out what we would do at the very start of the game. So in this case, with a finitely repeated Prisoner's Dilemma game, the Nash equilibrium is still to defect all the way through. The standard game theory approach to this would be to show that it's rational to play cheat in all 100 levels of the game. But this type of unraveling need not occur in all repeated play or finite stage games. We can think of an example here where we have two players first playing a Prisoner's Dilemma game and then a coordination game. In this setup, we can think about the standard Prisoner's Dilemma game as being this option over here on the left, where players have payoffs of 5, 5, 0, 6, 6, 0, and 1, 1. And then a coordination setup, where if we coordinate left, left, we get a payoff of 3, 3. If we coordinate right, right, we get a payoff of 5, 5. And other than that, we have the payoffs of 0, 0. We can think about these standard play if these were non-sequential games and think about what would happen for the individual. We would expect with standard Nash play in a Prisoner's Dilemma game that we reach the cheat, cheat, or don't cooperate, don't cooperate outcome of 1-1. One, one. And then if we look at the coordination game, if we understand a focal point of right, right being better for both of us, and we're attracted to that coordination point, we would get a payoff of 5-5, five, five for a total payoff of six if we played both of these games, not sequentially, but just totally separately, and we had standard Nash play. However, let's imagine that we play these sequentially. We have finite repetition. We play one, then the other. We know there's just two stages to this game. And what we'll see is we won't get the unraveling that we had before when we had the 100 stage Prisoner's Dilemma game. Imagine that you could communicate ahead of time within this game. Each player plays left in the second game if either player fails to cooperate in the first game and we play right otherwise. So if we allow this communication in, we actually can get a better solution from this game, but let's understand why. Now, what is this communication again? This communication is such that if anyone cheats in round one, we're supposed to play left, left in round two. We're making left, left the focal point if anyone cheats. But if no one cheats in round one, then we play right, right in round two of the coordination game here. We can think about how this allows for a better possible outcome than that six total points that we would show if we had just standard Nash play in these two games. So what is the incentive for cooperation versus cheating when we think about these games being played sequentially and we have that communication of if anyone cheats, it's focal now to play left left in stage two. Think about the best case scenario for you, player one. Right? The best case scenario for you being player one is you don't cooperate, but player two does cooperate. So you cheat player two, but player two does not cheat, right? Uh, player two cooperates in this situation. You don't cooperate. So what you end up with is six points right away in stage one of this game. Now, once we've done this, we have communicated that, hey, if someone cheats, if someone doesn't cooperate, left is now the focal response. And so what happens is you get those six points and then you, player one, know that I am going to play left. I have been told, we have communicated that left is the best strategy if anyone cheats in round one. And so the best thing for you to do, knowing that I am going to play left, is for you to compare your payoff 
of playing right versus your payoff of playing left. And you should choose three over zero. And so the best case scenario for you from cheating in round one and not cooperating is to get six in round one and then to play left in round two because we have made focal that if anyone cheats, we play left. And so we get this left left payoff. And so you end up with a total of nine points from this strategy of cheating when I don't cheat. Okay. And so what happens is we could end up with, however, if we both cheated, if we both chose don't cooperate in round one, you would get a payoff of one. This is quite a terrible start here. And now we have made focal to play left left if anyone cheats and you would get a payoff of three. So you could end up with four if I also cheated the system and did not cooperate. But let's look at what happens if you decide, okay, maybe I shouldn't, shouldn't cheat. Maybe I should just cooperate in round one. What happens if you co cooperate in round one? Say you cooperate in game one and the other person does as well. So player two cooperates with you. Then what happens is you get a payoff of five. Now that you have a payoff of five and no one has cooperated in this game, what happens is then the focal point becomes right, right. And you also get a payoff of five. So your total payoff becomes 10. Better than your best case scenario payoff from cheating me, from not cooperating, getting six points and then getting three points in round two. So this becomes your best strategy is to cooperate with me. Now, why could you count on cooperation from me also? You need me to play cooperate in order for you to get this cooperate, cooperate five points and then to get the five more. Well, because my payoffs are symmetric to yours. And guess what? My payoffs is player two. It's best for me to do the exact same thing. Best case scenario for me if you cooperate is for me to cheat you and to get six points here. And then what happens is it becomes focal to play left left because if either of us cheat, left left becomes the focal communication point that we said, hey, we will play that if anybody cheats in round one. So the best I could do would be nine if I cheated you in round one. So it's not to my advantage to cheat you in round one, just as it's not to your advantage to try and cheat in round one. And so we both cooperate in round one and we get the five five and then we have focal being the five five with the coordination game second and we end up with a payoff of 10. So it becomes Nash play. It becomes rational economic agent play to have both of us cooperate and this game doesn't unravel. We sustain cooperation by having the second game with two pure strategy Nash equilibria have a focal point with the higher payoff that could sustain the cooperation in round one. So when we have finite repetition of games, it does not imply unraveling, but unraveling could occur. When we have this two stage game, we can think about, okay, well, what happens? And we have to go through this kind of backward induction, seeing what happens at the end. And can we sustain cooperation at the earlier rounds if we end up with any kind of different outcome at the second stage? If you reversed the order of these two games, if we played the coordination game first and the prisoners game second, would that game unravel? Try and figure that out yourself. But the answer is yes, that game's gonna unravel just like the 100 uh, round prisoners dilemma game uh, story unraveled. And so you can think about different orderings of different games and think about, does it help us open up more equilibria or does it unravel and we don't actually get any more cooperation when we have a finitely repeated game? Okay, so let's move on to the other type here, an infinitely repeated game. In reality, few games literally last forever, but many games always have a chance to continue on. If a game has a chance to continue on, we call that infinitely repeated. We don't know the finite number of times we're gonna play this game, there's like a probability that the game will continue on. So even though it might end at some point, we count that as infinitely repeated because there's always this chance that the game could go on. There's always a chance it could continue on. With infinite repetition, 
The previous unraveling logic of the 100 stage prisoner's dilemma game no longer holds because we can't say at the last round, round 100, there's no incentive for us to sustain any level of cooperation. It's dominant for me to cheat because we don't know when the last stage is. There's always a chance that this game could continue on. This allows for more equilibria to potentially become sustainable. So now the intuition of retaliation can work in a situation like this. One can no longer just look to the future, do backward induction from the last stage, and end up with an understanding of, okay, well, there's nothing that I can do at this last stage here. You can take different strategies now and try retaliations to create the proper incentives to sustain cooperation or to avoid that defection. So for example, we can think about the incentives of cooperation in an infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma game, right? So here we'll assume that the players think of themselves as playing the game forever, that you can add in more complicated math to adjust for probabilities of game stopping and things like that. But we're just gonna assume pure infinite repetition and we're going to try and work this through by thinking about how we can make these more equilibria sustainable and avoid this unraveling problem in an infinite game. In order to do this, we need a little bit of math to prove that more equilibria become sustainable. In many cases, the math, as I said, is a little bit more complex, but we're gonna to stick to a simple strategy to keep the math simple and yet still prove the concept that more equilibria become possible. The simple strategy that we're going to use is going to be a trigger strategy. A trigger strategy is a situation where cooperative play ends permanently once one person cheats. Sometimes this is referred to as the grim reaper strategy or as a pure grudge holder strategy. Cooperative play cuts off entirely once defection is observed. This creates a very strong incentive not to cheat. If someone cheats once, boom, the other player, if they're playing a trigger strategy, they're gonna cheat for forevermore. There is some concern in real, the real world for playing trigger strategies because what if there's a possible misinterpretation of others actions, then all of a sudden you're stuck with this doomsday type device that has already been triggered and you're playing this trigger strategy and you might not be able to get out. So let's look at a standard prisoner's dilemma game setup that we have here. We can see the various payoffs for Mac and Charlie. What we're gonna do is we're gonna play an infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma game with the two of them. And what we're gonna do is we're going to try and see if we can get Charlie to cooperate. So that's gonna be the goal. Can we get cooperation sustained throughout from Charlie by taking a different strategy as Mac? So is there a way to get Charlie to cooperate and to sustain cooperation with Mac having a certain strategy. And that strategy we're going to employ is going to be a trigger strategy. Does it sustain cooperation or do we get unraveling? So let's think about Charlie's incentive to cheat in this situation. If Charlie cheats and let's say Mac cooperates, Charlie's first payoff then becomes 60. But if Mac is playing a trigger strategy forever after that, Mac is cheating. And the best thing that Charlie can do if Mac is cheating is get a payoff of 10 forevermore. So Charlie's payoffs, if he cheats in that first round, would be that he would get 60 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10 forevermore. But we have to understand that when we get these future payoffs, those future payoffs aren't as important as the current payoffs. Payoffs now presumably are better than payoffs later. In economic theory, this is something that we hold throughout many models that work through time. We need to discount the future payoffs for elapsed time. If I do not care at all about my future and all I want is the big upfront payment, why would I care if you threaten me with a trigger strategy? We need to think about how we discount those future payoffs. If my future payoffs don't matter at all, I want that 60 up front, and who cares that I get these smaller 10 payoffs in the future? Well, it depends on how much I do discount the future. 
Usually I don't just have the future being equal to exactly what it's worth now, but if I did, we could imagine that as a discount of one. Future payments are exactly worth current payments. We could also have a discount rate where future payments are totally worthless. Again, an extreme assumption that's not usually true, but we can think about that hypothetical where we have a discount rate and here we could label that as a D equals zero. In this case, the future payment is totally worthless, right? It's worth absolutely nothing. So now let's go back and think about these payoffs for Charlie and how we can discount them for when they happen. At stage two, I need to discount some. At stage three, I need to discount more. At stage four, I need to discount even more. So the way that we can mathematically show this is that the payoffs for Charlie to cheat will be, I get a payoff of 60 if I'm Charlie right away. That's not discounted at all. But then once we go to time period one, we have some discount rate. And that discount rate is that D. The larger the D is, the more I value the future money and the less it's discounted. But nonetheless, it's discounted some. So that payoff of 10 is discounted some when it's compared back to today's terms, today's payoffs. And then stage two, it gets discounted twice, D squared. Stage three, D cubed, and so on and so on. Right. So we want to think about, now that we have this discounted, this is Charlie's payoff to cheat. But what is Charlie's payoff to cooperate? If Mac is playing a trigger strategy, he cooperates first, but then if Charlie ever cheats, he will cheat forevermore. So Mac starts off cooperating. Well, we're here, we're thinking about Charlie cooperating and what his payoffs would be. So if Charlie starts off cooperating and Mac cooperates, they get 20. And then Mac is gonna continue to cooperate. And so Charlie's thinking about what are my payoffs for cooperating? He continues to cooperate and we get these payoffs of 20 for forevermore. But these payoffs, again, must be discounted. The first one, not discounted. It's in today's payoffs terms. But the next stage, well, that happens somewhere into the future, and so it has to be discounted somewhat. So we have to think about the payoffs on into the future for Charlie and how much they should be discounted. One stage in gets discounted by D. Two stages in, D squared, and so on and so on. We know we'll be able to sustain cooperation as long as the payoff for cooperation is greater than the payoff for cheating. Mathematically, now that we have set this up, we can see that this is equivalent to saying that the payoff for cooperation, 20 plus 20 to the D plus 20 D squared plus 20 D to the third and so on and so on and so on for forevermore needs to be greater than 60 plus 10 discounted plus 10 discounted squared and so on and so on for forevermore. And so now with the mathematics, what we need to do is just show that this payoff for cooperation is greater than the payoff for cheating if we're going to sustain cooperation. And so we can just rearrange some of these equations and reduce some stuff down. And so what we can do is we can take this element over here of 10 D plus 10 D squared plus 10 D cubed forevermore. And we can subtract that from both sides of the equation. And then we can also subtract this 20 from both sides of the equation. And what happens is we are left with 10D plus 10D squared plus 10D cubed for forevermore is greater than 40. And then from here, what we can do is we can kind of rearrange. We can pull the 10 out of the equation here. So we have 10 multiplied by our D plus D squared plus D cubed and so on for forevermore is greater than 40. And we can reduce that down by dividing both sides by 10 and we end up with the D plus D squared plus D cubed for forevermore has to be greater than four. The real trick that we've done here is we have to isolate that D plus D squared plus D cubed uh, element that goes for forevermore because there's a little trick within mathematics that that can be reduced down to D over one minus D. So this D plus D squared plus D cubed plus D to the fourth, D to the fifth, D to the sixth, and so on and so on. Actually, mathematically, we get a little cheat here that you can reduce this down to D divided by one minus D. Now, with this information, we can actually do the math and solve for things. 
So now what we can do is we can look at the payoff for cooperation, d plus d squared plus d cubed is greater than four, and we can reduce this down and we can say, okay, well, this is really equivalent to d over one minus d has to be greater than four. And we can multiply both sides by that one minus d. And we can end up with d is greater than four minus four d. And then we can reduce this and we can add the four d to both sides and we end up with five d is greater than four. Now what we can do is just simply divide both by five and we end up with d has to be greater than 0.8. So we know that the payoff for cooperation will be greater than the payoff for cheating for Charlie as long as his discount rate is greater than 0.8. In this case, we could sustain cooperation as long as Charlie's discount is greater than 0.8. Thus, we've shown that equilibria other than the unravel unraveling of the finitely repeated prisoner's dilemma game is achievable in this infinite repetition world. Granted, it only happens in some situations, situations where Charlie's discount rate is greater than 0.8, but this could change with various different payoffs from the prisoner's dilemma game. And this can happen in different kinds of situations. And so we can think about multiple ways in which we can get sustained cooperation from thinking about payoffs through time in an infinitely repeated game. And we have the mathematics to show with a discount rate what happens.